our dear viewers and listeners, we greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome every one of you to today's Bible study as we continue this wonderful journey in the wonderful book of Romans. I invite you to invite someone. Tell them to log in so that together we can be companions on this spiritual journey where our eyes will be open, where our spiritual lives will be enriched, where our lives will never be the same again. Before we begin, let's take this moment and dedicate this time before God with the word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you yes, Lord. for your word. Yes, Lord. It is life. Mm -hmm. It is health. Mm -hmm. It is hope. Yes, Lord. It is resurrection. Yes, Lord. It is light oh, yeah. and, re and life. Oh, yes. We receive it yes, with meekness, mm -hmm. with grace, oh, right. with joy. Yes, Lord. Have your way today. Have your way. We are glad mm -hmm. for the gift of your word. Mm -hmm. Bless oh. it today oh, yeah. to the praise and glory oh, yes, Lord. of our Lord and Savior, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We'll be taking our reading today from the book of Romans, chapter 1, from verse 28, and we'll go all the way up to Romans, chapter 2, verse 6. Let's read. The Bible says, Bible and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, etima, full of envy, ngabajudobuja, murder, obusi, strife, okuyomba, deceit, obukusa, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, oryoma, backbiters, bageya, haters of God, wakatonda, violent, bachedu, proud, bamalala, boasters, benyumiriza, inventors of evil things, obubi, disobedient to parents, undisciplined, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do them, but also approve those who practice them. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are, who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to the truth against those who practice such things. And you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same that you will escape the judgment of God or oh, do you despise the riches of his goodness forbearance and long suffering not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance but in accordance with your hardness and your impertinent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day 
over us. And the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Who will render to each according to his deeds. Today we are looking at God's impartiality in judgment. And the truth is I want, that I want every one of us to understand that the time is coming where every one of us, every responsible person, on the basis of their actions and attitudes, will meet with the final judgment of God, either as eternal life all as wrath and fury in this time. Somebody asked me a question. He said, why do you talk about the judgment of God? What good does talking about God's judgment achieve? That doesn't it make life more dismal? and cast a shadow on a God of love. You see, the fact is this. You will never appreciate the goodness in the news until you understand how bad it could have been. Like I told you last week, grace is not amazing until you understand what it is you are saved from. So why do we talk about the judgment of God? And today we'll give you three reasons. The first reason why we talk about the judgment of God is because it is so prominent in scripture. You cannot deny it. And we as teachers of the word need to unfold to the whole counsel of God. So we cannot go cherry picking. In Matthew 10, verse 14 to 15, as he sends out the disciples, he tells them, whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words, as you go out of that house, or that city, shake off the dust of your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than of that city. Why God, the Bible tells us in Acts of the Apostles chapter 17 and verse 31 that God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. And that man is Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 the Bible says it is appointed unto man wants to die. And after that, judgment. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 to 27. The Bible says that if we go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remain remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire 
that we consume the adversary. You see, as teachers of the word, we can't overlook such scriptures. We cannot neglect the theme that goes throughout scripture and still remain with a clear conscience while preaching the gospel. The second reason why we talk about judgment is because for some people the fear of judgment may be the only motivation they need for them to come to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. I, I'm not sure, but I believe that some people come to salvation because of the fear of hell. So if that is what will cause a person to shake free from all the bondage of sin and run into the open arms of the Father. Why not? So be it. Yes, I do understand that there are better reasons. But you see, we are all different. And for some, it could be love that draws us. For some of us, it is the actual fear of what will happen if you don't receive the love that God has prevailed, has availed to us. Look at what Jesus says. Luke chapter 12, verse 4 and verse 5. Jesus is teaching and he says do not fear those who kill the body and afterwards have no more that they can do. You see when man kills you all they kill is the body. When a terrorist fires off a bomb, all they kill is the body. There is nothing more that they can do. Yes, we will mourn the loss of life. But there is nothing more than that that can be done by that, by that individual. What next? Nothing. He says, but I warn you to whom to fear. Yeah, fear the one who after he has killed has authority to cast in hell. And that is God. I tell you, Jesus says, fear him. What is Jesus? He's putting it point blank. Yes, You see, sometimes the fear of judgment is what you need to draw you to salvation. The third reason why we talk about judgment is because it reveals an inevitable part of God's character. And therefore helps us to love him for who he is. You see, if hearing God's judgment makes it harder for us to love God, then possibly the God that you love is a figment of your own imagination and not the real true God. But if you love the real true God, then you must desire to know this God. And this encompasses who he is. He is not just a God of love. He is also a God of justice. So today, 
look at who will be judged. As we go on from what we began last week. Last week we saw that the wrath of God is aimed at all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men. Now, Having understood that, Paul then goes at depth to explain to us what that entails. And he drew a list of 21 sins. And I said it is not an exhaustive list. Because every day people are inventing sin. And that is the characteristic of the age that we are in. I remember one time somebody challenged me about a particular sin. And said, a pastor, I don't see it in the Bible. I said, very well. But the fact the Bible talks about inventors of sin. In other words, they will invent sins that have not previously been documented. The fact that it hasn't been documented doesn't make a resit. Why? Because the f they will be people that will invent and we saw that as one of the characteristics of these ungodly and unrighteous people. Now, Paul here, Paolo, in chapter 2, expands this list. And in verse 5 and 6, he says, according to your hardness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath. And the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to his deeds. I want that last bit. Who will render to each person according to his deeds? To each person, the question is who will be judged? According to deeds, everybody will be judged. So Paul then goes backwards and he begins to paint this picture. In chapter 1 verse 20 to 21 we saw what a godless person will do. And he begins to explain in 2021 that yes, these people have received the general revelation of who God is. And in that, I told you there are two kinds of revelation of God. There is the general one. Which he says in verse 24, since the creation of the world, World. His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. For even his divine power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not not glorify him as God. No, we were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. In other words, there is sufficient knowledge available for everyone to know that God exists. He is worthy 
of honor as God. He's worthy of the worship as God. He's worthy of our gratitude as God. And he says, yet people don't do it. And he goes on to say that they are without excuse. Now, as it goes down, he goes on to explain what happens when people reject God. And he says, though they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And then the Bible says, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things that are not fitting. And he breaks it all down up to verse 32. Now, when he continue, when you see this analysis to that first century Christian, beginning with the rejection of God, who has revealed himself in nature, we understand that when men reject God, three things happen. Number one, they turn to false gods. Why? Because man naturally is made to worship. So if it is not God Almighty, the creator of the universe, then they worship the created. And through his description, secondly, we realize that there will be widespread destruction of the home because of sexual immorality and sexual perversion. And thirdly, we note a spirit of violence, a spirit of cruelty that has total disregard to human values and human rights spreading throughout. Now, what is amazing is transport that picture from the first century to where we are right now in the 21st century. And the same truth now, to someone who is talking about them in the first century, you had two classes of people. You had the Jews who knew God. You had the Gentiles who did not know about God. Now, to them, the Jews who knew God. When they talk about this happening to the people who are ungodly, they are the first to put up their hands and say, no, they are not talking about us. They are, this does not describe us. We are not them. And similarly, even today, when we read this text, there are so many people that will put up their hand and say, no, that, that, that's not us. You see, those people were wicked. Those, that refers to people who are ungodly. People who are gross, people who are wicked. We are not them. We are law-abiding citizens. We love our homes. We are clean. We are decent people. We are church members. Yes, for some of those that don't go to church. Yes, perhaps they don't. 
But they say we have moral standards and we uphold them. We have we have values. We have culture. We are we are law abiding citizens. And you see, we are not wicked. That belongs to the gangsters. That belongs to the radicals. That belongs to the mafia. The pimps, the prostitutes. They have devised every name to put them in the bracket and say, no, that refers to them. It doesn't refer to us. So actually, they say, for us, we are the sport of the earth. We are the people who bring sanity to this world. Yet without the saving grace of Jesus Christ, Paul addresses them and says, in chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, Therefore, you are inexcusable. He says, let me first show you the first one. The first one is rejected God. When they rejected God, God gave them up. You see, every time we reject God gives us up. <laughs> so he lets us go. Now these ones, they have a knowledge of God. They belong to that group of those that have the special knowledge of God. Now the Apostle Paul turns his attention to this group and he uses the second person. In other words, he's not talking to an entire congregation. He's now speaking to the human heart. As they are thinking through this, as they are processing this information, he says you are Therefore, inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge one another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. What is he trying to say here? You see, they may not be homosexuals, but they may not be backbiters. They may not be haters of God. They may not be violent. But they could be untrustworthy. Unloving. Unforgiving. Unmerciful. He says, if you practice those, you may judge the other, but by judging them, you also practice the same things. He says these people that you believe are different. And he's talking to a people who have an, a clear understanding of God's standard. They know what is wrong and what is right. So these are the people that he talks about. So they have a view of what is wrong in society. And he says, because you do the same things, you are guilty. So the judges are now as guilty as those that are in the dock being judged. And when you come to that point, they're like, who, oh, how, how, how could it be? How would I find myself in this? You see, like some of us right now are saying impossible. But look at what Jesus says in Matthew 25. When he reminds us, verse 31 to 46, on what will happen on the day of judgment, he said he will separate into two bands the sheep and the goats. 
And the test of judgment is made on the basis of how they treated others. And remember, he will say to the sheep, and he will tell them, when I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. And they would, they would say, when? When did we do that? And they say, when you did it to the least of these, you did them to me. And you see, he will say the same to the goats. And then they will say, how could that have happened? You see, on that day of unveiling, it will be a day of surprises. So why is that so? Because it drives the point home that we are all guilty. And for many times we miss the mark. The fact eludes us that we are actually guilty. And this is for three reasons. Number one, because we are congenitally blind towards our own faults. We, we are not aware of the wrongs that we are doing. We don't see that what we are doing is wrong. Even though others can actually see them. You see, one of the greatest lies of our age is that we know ourselves. So I know who I am. Uh, do you think you know yourself? No. You don't know yourself. <laughs> you are blind to so much about your life. You see, there are areas in your life where you have been hurtful, where you have been sinful, and you are unaware of. And it takes the the move of the Spirit. It takes the revelation of the Holy Spirit to bring certain things to light. You see why? Because many times we are blind to who we are. We are choose others of what we ourselves are actually doing. Have you ever tried to, I mean, spoken to youth of some other people and you 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 drive it home that they are procrastinating. And yet when your boss or somebody asks you to do something, you say, Oh, I will I will, I will do it tomorrow. What are you doing? You are using two different measures. For the others, you take the higher standard. When it comes to you, you lower the standards. So the second reason why it, our guilt often eludes us is because we conveniently forget that what we did was wrong. You say at the time of committing the sin, we are aware. But you know, after some time, we kind of think, you know, God will forget it. So we don't acknowledge it in any way. We don't bring it to the cross. We don't repent of it. And as our sins fade away in memory, we think that it is going to fade away in God's memory as well. But that's not the way it is. That, that, that's not the way it works. And in the Bible, a number of times Jesus brings it to the fore. In his sermon on the mount, he says something. He says, 
if we hold feelings of animosity uh, or hatred towards somebody else, when we are bitter, when we are resentful, when we are filled with malice towards one another, he says we are not different from murderers, we are murdering. In other words, he says you are guilty of murder. Not any different from somebody who gets a gun and poof, shoots another. He says also in that discourse, he says if we find ourselves continually lasting, in our minds, not in our bodies, in our minds, to treat the fantasy, sexual fantasies over somebody else. He says we have committed adult or you have fornicated. Really? Yes. That's what he says. He says if you fill yourself with pride, and you put on an, an appearance of humility. And you are not considerate of others. He says you are the worst of sinners. You see, these things almost go unnoticed before people. But God notices them. Why? Because God looks at the heart. He sees all the actions that we conveniently forget. He sees where we cut down people with our words. He sees where we are spiteful in our actions. He sees where we are unfair in our business transactions. He sees is it when we are uncooperative, when we are stubborn? in the situations that we are in. You see, there is, you see, we may say, but this is small. No, it is not insignificant. It, God sees it all. And God will bring it to account. The third reason why this almost eludes us is because today, we have a world with our words. And we have used these words to our own detriment. You see, now, certain words that we no longer use. So we call lying, we call it a credibility gap. You see, well, adultery. We say they were having an affair. No, no, when we're stealing, we call it misappropriation. You see, you see they look at the heavy words we are using. Now, we, we, we go out of the way, drunkenness. <laughs> We say that is a disease. When it comes to sodomy, homosexuality, we call it an alternative lifestyle. Now, now look at the words. We have a way with words. Abortion. We call it a, a woman's right to choose. For, fornication. We call it flirtation. You see, now, look, you see, we come to a point where people no longer lie and cheat. You say you are stretching the truth a little. So when we talk about when we betray people, we are talking about it in the names of protecting our rights. So, so now we now begin other people steal. So now when we steal, we call it borrowing. So when we, when we 
kill when we murder when we do wrong we call it exploiting so we, and all this no matter what word we use jesus is saying yes when others do it, we are saying, stone them. And Jesus is saying, let him who is without sin among you be the first one to cast the stone. You see, we are all guilty. And what Jesus is what Paul is addressing here is the spirit of hypocrisy. It is that act of playing someone else other than being yourself. See, hypocrisy is a very interesting has a very interesting Greek word. It has two words. The first word is hupo. The second word is krino. Now kupo means under. Krino means judge. Krino to judge. So, so to judge under. So basically, you're giving off judgment, but and behind a mask. So what that means is that the true identity of the person is covered up. And this we get from the stages of theater. You see, an actor would put on a mask. And so they painted a picture of somebody that they were actually not. So when we take that to the New Testament, one assumes the mannerisms. The speech, the character of someone. We now adopt the language, the Christianese. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you. I am highly and I'm highly favored of the Lord. Yet on the inside, you are knowing said if I you see, Christianity requires us to be open, to be integral, one inside and out. And here, Paul points out to us that the judgment of God is on a hypocritical heart. Without saying hypocrisy, he points out what actually reveals hypocrisy. And the judgment is on two accounts. One, because people are blind to sin. They have allowed themselves to be blinded by sin. And this is what we see from verse 1 to verse 3. And verse 1 5 gives us the second criteria why God's judgment will come upon such people. It is because their hearts have been hardened. So let's look at the first one. You see, the first one that he brings about from verse 1 to 3, this points to somebody who considers themselves morally okay. See, and they, they have already drawn the line. When this is said, they're like, no, that's not me. They're like, yes, I agree with you. That wrath of God should actually go to these people. See, for them, the whole rejection 
and the wrath that follows the rejection. Where they exchange the image of God. Then God says, okay, that's what you want, take it. <laughs> so when you exchange, God gives over to what you have exchanged. So for them, they being hypocrites, this is what happens. They judge others for what they themselves are doing. They are participating in the same thing. And here he's saying you judge, yet you practice the same things that you judge. And yet, those who practice those things are rightly judged by God. So you do the same and you expect God to treat you different. So you want God to treat you different when you do exactly the same things. Why? Because for you, you have a special revelation. You have a special knowledge of who God is. Remember the Jew had the covenants of God. These are the people that God had spoken to. They knew God. They had a relationship with him. Now, for them, they expect that because of that relationship, they will do what the Gentiles are doing and then get away with it. Here, Paul is saying, no, they are guilty of sin. And so are you. It's so, it's, and now he begins to unveil to them that they should begin to ponder upon their hypocrisy. You see, many times we see it all over the news. And what things you believe, no, it is them and not me. But Paul goes on to drive the point home. He says the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice the things. And there is no problem with that. But he's trying to say something. That the same judgment is upon you. And here is something very important that I want to unveil here. You see, for the time that I have traveled and the people that I have met, there is one verse that is so commonly quoted all over the place. They know it in the whole Bible. Even the atheists know it. And that verse is Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. They may not know where it is, but they quote it. And what is that phrase? You shall not judge, lest you be judged. So, <laughs> everywhere you go, why do you judge me? Even the Bible says you shall not judge. But look at what the text says. Let's visit the text and understand what Paul is saying. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. We need to take it all the way up to verse 5 so that we get the whole response holistically. He says, judge not and you be not judged. For with the 
what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? But do not consider the plank in your own. So how do you say to your brother, let me remove the speck in your eye and look a plank is in your own eye. And Jesus says, hypocrite, hypocrino, First, remove the plank from your own eye. Then you will be able to see more clearly and remove the speck from your brother's eye. What is Jesus saying? Here, Jesus is saying, first turn the light on to you. Remove the plank. Then you'll be able to see the speck. It says, before you judge, judge self. Then it will put you in position to be able to judge others. So here, what do we see? Here, the problem is not the judging. Here, the problem is the hypocrisy. So what Paul is saying here, and where he's turning the light on, we can see it in verse 3. It says, if you pass judgment on those who practice ungodliness and unrighteousness and then and do the same to yourself, it says, then what do you think will happen? Basically, first look at self. And then you'll be able to escape that judgment. And once you understand that, it draws questions. Do you hold people to standards that you are not willing to humbly apply? Are you oblivious or just blind to your own sins? Do you get angry when at other people's pride and yet you have a pride in your own heart? Are you quick to want forgiveness but slow to give it? Are you quick to point out the evil or the things or issues with other people without even thinking where their own is? So you need to look inside because that's where the judgment is. Paul then also goes on to state that the reason why these people will be under God's judgment. He says it's because of the hypocritical heart which is hardened to repentance. You see, the Jew, back to the Jew, they had a relationship. They were God's chosen people. They had the law. But because they are now receiving God's kindness and his tolerance, his patience, they counted it as no God is okay with what we are doing. No, Paul here says, no, that's not it. Uh, he is trying to say something. He's pointing them to the fact that their hearts are being hardened. So that the word there is kataphroneo, which means from where we get the word Sclerosis. Uh, for you who have studied about diseases, you know about the arteries hardening on the inside when fat gets on the inside. You see, every sin 
if not dealt with, comes with the ability of bringing contempt. And you begin to harden. So the God's kindness is not the excuse for you and I to sin. God's long suffering and patience is the opportunity that God gives us to lead us to repentance. But he says, but in the stubbornness of your heart, and your repentant heart. That hardness of heart. He says we are storing up for ourselves the wrath of God. And he uses an unlike word. He talks about treasure. You see, storing up wrath is the Greek word Theisorizo. Now, theisorizo means to amass, to heap up. So, like you would gain treasures or wealth. Now, what you are storing up is the wrath of God. So, where does that lead us? It leads us to three principal things that I believe are our takeaways. Number one, we need to self reflect. We need to turn the torch inward. David gives us an example to follow. Psalm 139, verse 23 to 24. He says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there is any hurtful way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That should be our heart. Allow the Spirit of God to do a work internally to lead you to that place of repentance. Secondly, after the torch has been lit in you, deal with your own sinfulness before you look out to others. You see, repentance is a gift, a gift which not many people want. But it is the gift that is necessary for us to gain that trajectory back to a thriving fellowship and relationship with the Lord of God. Number three, we need to understand that sometimes God's kindness, God's mercy in our lives and tolerance to our sins is an opportunity for us to repent. It's not God saying it is okay. It is God saying it is wrong. And I'm giving you the time to put it right. Why? Because there is coming a time when you will give an account for the life that you have lived. So are you there and have never received Jesus in your life as your personal Savior and Lord? This journey begins with accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. So if you are there, Turn to God. Say this prayer with me. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I am a sinner. 
I need a savior in my life. Jesus, you are the savior. You are that savior whose blood was shed for the sins of mankind. I believe that you died for my sins and rose again from the dead. I receive you in my life as my Lord and savior. I believe and receive what you died to purchase for me. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to live this life for you. Glorifying your name forever. Amen. If you say that word, that prayer from the bottom of your heart, there you are. Voila, like the French would say, you have been saved. Now, there is a number on your screen. Please call it. Someone will pick it and give you the first instruction in the faith. And God will guide you. God will strengthen you. God will preserve you. Manifest his goodness. Manifest his purpose for your life. To you that is born again, saved, wondrously by the blood of Jesus Christ. Apply this. Turn, allow the Spirit of God to enable you to live victoriously over what many people are falling under. It begins with you. Allow him to turn the light on in you. Do a new work in you. Light you up so that you light the world. God bless you as you do this from Dominion Church. It's been a pleasure having you. The message is God's judgment is impartial. Whether you know him or you don't know him, sin is sin. God bless you as you hear the word of God. Shalom. Amen.